focus precedes success. I think most people quit growing. You know what? It doesn't make any difference what you buy because you'll end up in negative. We become legends in our own mind. How do you go from being a busy professional to creating over $250,000 every single year in cash flow? This is going to be Rishabh's story, how he did it, and how you can do the same. So, Rishabh, welcome. Thank you. So, 32 single families, 18 units, right, in a multifamily building, and $20,000 in net cash flow every single month. So, that's quarter million bucks just from cash flow. That's a lot, a lot of money, man. But I noticed it took you 11 years to get here, about, mm -hmm. right, 11, 12 years. Today, looking back, you think that can be done any sooner? Absolutely. So uh, what do you think, why do you think it took as long as it took? Multiple reasons. Okay. But I think the one very important reason for anybody and, and me as well is focus precedes success. Okay. So focus precedes success. So let's kind of roll the clock back, yeah. right? Uh, you're Indian, obviously, by heritage, yeah. right? So did you come here for college? How did you end up in U.S.? Yeah. 2004. Okay. I came for my master's. In, so it'll be I 20 landed years. in Chicago. It'll yes. be 20 years. Okay. Yes. So you come here pursuing kind of the American dream, like uh, any other immigrant, basically. Yes. Right. Um, and what was the first thing you got into? Was it IT? What was it? IT. IT. IT okay. staffing, IT consulting business. IT uh, staffing, IT consulting. And what led you to first starting to buy real estate? <laughs> I was making good money uh, as a fresh college graduate. Okay. Way more money than my friends were making at the time. But I didn't even have like $2,000 in my pocket as to call my own. Okay. So I still remember I was working with a company at that time, an Indian small company at that time. And uh, I had to borrow literally $2,000 from my boss. And he said, Rishabh, you're making good money and you don't even have 2000 to your name? I mean, of course, in a very jovial manner. And that made me think that, you know what, that is right. Where is my money going? So that was the time when I started like, hey, you know what, I need to get better at finances, at budgeting. And then I stumbled upon a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that kind of opened up me to the idea of buying real estate. Got it. So that's how I did in 2011. Okay. So that was kind of what led you. Was it like almost, because the person I know today, Right, you're not one of those. That's not seems doesn't seem like your personality. That's somebody who will be. Uh, you spend money, but you're certainly a business person. That's my image uh, of you today. Yeah. At that time, was it that you were basically just not really paying attention to what was coming in, what was going out, kind of? I was spending every penny I got. Okay, was... I'll I'll say one thing. I used to have a I I did do some investments back in India, but any surplus money in U.S. was spent every day. So you're spending every penny, right, at the time, and yes. then was it at the time you go to your boss, hey man, I need to borrow two thousand bucks, right? Was there a sense of like, hey, what the hell am I doing? Was yeah. there that sense at that time? Yeah, of course. Right? I mean, and I think, you know, what happens is we all have those moments where there's a sense of shame, almost guilt. You're like, man, the hell am I doing? But I think that happens when you've not had a lot of money, suddenly you get some and you want to spend it, right? Or you start spending it, you don't even realize what you're doing until you're like, ah, this is foolish. But you caught that bug of real estate rather early, right? Yes. So in 2012, you had t 9, 10, 11, you had bought five properties, correct? In 11, yes. In 11. Now, at the time, were you buying them with basically purchase, rehab, um, rent, refi, and then repeat? Is that kind of what I, you were I was doing, Burr, yes. Okay. Yeah. So why did you stop? So 2011, I bought those. 2012, I parted ways with my previous employer, and I started right. my own business. So then to focus on, to, uh, on my new business, so... I stopped buying real estate, okay. So I could focus on my real uh, my, on my new business, if you will. Right. So you say, okay, this is my baby. This is my new business. I'm gonna grow it, um, and this is normal, right? Yes. Uh, now, 
can you imagine if you even at that time you have kept kept maybe buying one property at a, on the side or two properties? I yeah, right. I mean, I mean, that would be amazing. 2012, <laughs> 13, 14, 15, because you could jump back into it in 15. Yes, that would be even if you had bought two extra properties a year, right? Uh, which is consistency. That would be worth two two and a half million dollars today. Extra easy, easy, right? Easy, easy. because yes. the property prices were so cheap. Yes, right. And I think a lot of the, so today, looking back, right? If you were to give a young Rishab, an old Rishab could talk to, or the wiser Rishab could talk to the younger Rishab, would you say anything during that time period? Would you have done things a little differently? Buy real estate. Buy real estate, <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, literally, we would be talking about a three fifty four hundred thousand a year in net cash flow number, yes. right? Because it's the small things make that big a difference over a period of time. Correct. Okay. So now you had had one discipline, which is you paid down the properties, correct? In the past, yes. Right. Uh, you were paying down properties. You were not taking that money, and you were not spending that. Correct. Okay. So what is your thought with because a lot of per- Times people will say, well, what, why would you pay them down, man? Why not just keep scaling, keep growing? What is your thought about it today versus then? So th- things change, right? At that time, it was like, hey, you know what? I want to maximize more cash flow, um, and I have surplus money. I'm not investing anywhere. Why not pay the debt down? Right. I want to be debt-free or less debt. But over the time, I realized that if I want to scale up in my property acquisition, it takes cash, you need more cash because when you have the next opportunity and you don't have cash, you will miss the opportunity. So then how do you do that? You know, the easiest way is if you, for your existing portfolio, have a, a loan on them, a mortgage on them, so that way the extra cash can be used uh, for acquiring any number of properties you want. Got it. So at that point, then you get into the IT business again. I mean, recruitment and all that staffing, basically, right? And uh, that business was going good. Yes. Right? That business was going good. What brought you back in 2015 into jumping back into investing? So f- when I started my consulting business, it was doing good. But in 2015, that was, I think, the election year. Um, and 2015-16 was election year. And, you know, uh, things changed. So when the things changed Politically, uh, it did take effect on our business, on our industry. And that was a time when I said, you know what, I want an alternate uh, uh, income source. So my thought was, I was already doing real estate. I liked it. So why not get back to it? Okay. So that was the whole idea of getting back to it. And that's kind of how you showed up to us. That is right? correct. That's where you came up, came to mastery. Yes. So you had your way of doing real estate, yes. right? Yes. Uh, what was the reason for seeking out new information? Because a lot of times uh, when we have done something and we have been you know, successful, you had five properties. Mm-hmm. I bet you that was a heck of a lot more than any of your friends had, mm-hmm. right? Um, what was the reason you came seeking for new information? Scaling up, buying more properties, because the what happened was in 2015 when I started buying, like looking to buy again, uh, market had changed substantially from 2011, and I was missing out on deals. So if I keep missing out on deals, how would I acquire property? So that was my turning point where I want to learn how to acquire property in this new new year or you know the new new time zone, if you will. And that's how I stumbled upon you guys. Uh, like I want to learn how to scale up my uh, property uh, acquisition even in this market. Got so it. I didn't know what, what I was missing. I want to learn that part, what I'm missing. So this is an important point, which we were kind of talking as we were getting started, which is sometimes what happens is that as you get into real estate, right, you have to have a pulse of the market. Number one, you have to catch that pulse, right, meaning where are the prices for a certain product? Right? And it's the same thing. It doesn't matter if you're in a jewelry business, if you're in a real estate business, right? There's a pulse to the market. Right? Whatever product, service you deliver, even in IT consulting, right? Yes. there's a certain pay scale for a certain type of asset. There's certain things. Who is hiring? Who is firing? Who is not? Right? What, how is the market doing? And it becomes almost like specialized knowledge. 
Did you feel being kind of out because you were busy with running your own business, 2011, 2015, the market went up and your mindset was still in 2011? You feel that? 100%. 100%. Right? 100%. So you're, you're passing up good deals, which we would consider good deals. Yes. And you're like, no, man, I still want to buy property prices from 2011. Yeah. And it's like, hey, dude, no, no, no. For today, <laughs> this is an exceptional deal. Yeah. Right? And so at that time when we were talking about you know, I mean, obviously today the scale has changed, right? Today we're talking about, um, right, that you need to be at, like somebody like you, needs to be at somewhere around 40, 50,000 a month net, right? I mean, 100,000 a month is not, I mean, that's good, right, by our standards, right? But it's nothing to write home about, right? right. Because it's just everybody has grown in that journey, right, uh, of what cash flow looks like today. So, at that time, did you believe what we were saying that, hey, man, 30, 40, 50 properties are possible? It was a dream for sure. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Uh, but you, you saw yourself that that is something you would scale. Because right. intellectually, you could because yes. you're a smart guy, right? But was it possible that you could get to 50 properties? No. So there's a gap, right? So one is a dream. Like, right. hey, can I do it? Yes, I can do it. But another thing is how to do it. How to do it. The how was missing. Right. Right. Okay. And un unless anybody acquires that how, you cannot do it. Right. And I think the first is like you have to have a dream. Yes. Then you have to develop the skill sets to be able to start working towards that dream. Because there's a lot of people, it's like, you know, people are like, oh, I have an idea. Well, guess what? Take a seat. Right. <laughs> Everybody, we all have a million <laughs> ideas. It means nothing. Right. An idea is worthless. Right. There's no use of an idea because it's not the idea. Right. Everybody has a million ideas. A lot of ideas are the same. But yet, it's can you execute it and can you start making it a reality, right? 100%. Um, so from 2015, right, um, the business that you were in, um, and because this is important, right? Today, as we do this recording in the middle of 2024, right? Last six, seven years, man, it has been good in the IT market in general yeah. for at least on the employee side. Right? Yes. I mean, you could demand any bloody price that you want, and you quit a job, I mean, there's four more waiting. Yet today, we see the industry changing suddenly again. Right? People in IT are getting fired left and right, and they cannot find a job. Right? This is just how it is. So I guess I want to go back to uh, that question, which is how important is it to set up a plan B when plan A is working pretty damn well? Very important. Right. I mean, see, at the end of the thing, what matters is your end goal, right? What is the end goal? Uh, to reach the end goal, you could have a plan A, you could have plan B if plan A doesn't work, and you should also have a plan C if plan B doesn't work. So as long as you have a, a goal in mind, the end goal in mind, then how you reach the goal is just a plan. So for some people, like you said, you know, IT, you know, if, if you're in IT, uh, earning good money as an IT professional, great, until it works. If it doesn't work, then what's your plan B? Yeah, that's very You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because both of us have kind of Indian heritage, and so it's kind of an internal joke. But yet, if you told my parents, like my parents was, oh, you know, this person so-and-so is a PhD. Okay, great, <laughs> right? I mean, they're driving a scooter to, to uh, and that's an upgrade. Right. At that time uh, to work, I'm like, so what? Right. Certain person is a doctor. Right. Certain person is an engineer. I mean, it's this is just the reality of life. Yeah. That um, and I couldn't I can I mean, and I'm sure you'll relate to this. Down the street, we had a guy who had a tea stall. Right. I mean, today, everybody's familiar with YouTube. In India, we call him the Chaiwala. Yeah. Right. And the Chaiwala is like a guy who failed at everything. Clearly, it probably came from poor family. But, and it used to be the old joke that the Chaiwala in the building that he used to have a tea stand at in the, uh, on the street level, upstairs were all medical offices. Guess who owned the building? The Chaiwala? The Chaiwala. <laughs> sure. Right? And that's called cash flow. And I will never forget this because I used to ask my mom all the time. My mom was like, oh, no, no, no. That's like a chai stand business. I'm like, mom. It's a chai stand business, but today in the most expensive part of town, eight buildings on each side he owns. Yeah. I mean, it's simple. It's cash flow for life. Yes. In 
Kanpur, India, right? I mean, like this is a literally, and a lot of times what we do is we judge a person by what they do to trade eight hours. Meaning if you're gonna work as an engineer or as an IT professional or as a doctor or as a barista, right? In America, we'll call that person a barista in today's language, right? But yet, if you own that little coffee shop and you're putting the same eight hours in, yes, maybe the doctor may make 250, 300, 400. But if at the end of the year, both of them are spending whatever they make, one person buys the building and the other person buys three Mercedes, who's the smarter one? The one who buys a building. Right? Yeah. And a lot of times, and especially for immigrants, this is, we take pride in where do you work? Mm -hmm. Right? Oh my God, at the time. I mean, mm -hmm. you work, my son works for Motorola, mm -hmm. right? Or IBM, right? <laughs> I mean, if he's a bloody janitor or if he's the CEO of the company, nobody's going to ask. Yeah. Oh my God, he's at Motorola. Oh, must be very, very <laughs> smart, right? And it, this is a, and we all have hangups, right? And especially immigrants, I think we try to make up for it by saying where we work, right? So was this bug about entrepreneurship or this cash flow thing, was this always there or did you kind of get it by <laughs> figuring out the instability of a job? No, great question. Actually, I still remember to the date. Uh, when I was a kid, probably six, seven years old or eight years old, something like that, my dad used to work in a bank. He was a bank manager, officer first, then become a bank manager. And he would, one of his biggest tasks as a manager was to approve loans for business people. Every day, I mean, almost every day when he comes home and we're talking over dinner, the talk would be, there was a businessman, this is how he makes money. Even if he makes one rupee back in India, right? Uh, in that selling that one, one item, and he sells thousand a day. He makes thousand rupees in that day. Just one rupee. And I think that was one trigger when I was a kid that made me always think that, hey, how can we add more value and make more money on the side, right, as a business person? And that was one trigger. And then when I, another thing I remember is almost everybody in my family, except for my dad and a couple of other uncles, are in bis small businessmen. You know, they're all small businessmen. They have something going on. And uh, raised in a, a, a middle-class Indian family, it was always like, you know, hand-to-mouth, right? So I used to observe that. And I was like, man, you know what? This guy runs a business, small business at that right. time, right? But he has the car. He has this. We don't have that. So I was in my mind, it was always like, you know what? I got to do business when I grow up. I got to be an entrepreneur when I grow up. So I think combining those two things was the engine or the fire in me uh, where entrepreneurship was, I won't say natural, but it was an inclination in me. Got it. And that was also one reason why I end up being in America. Okay. You know, so it was there. Would it, was it there 100% at that time? Maybe not. So somebody listening to you, I mean, we have a lot of category of people that kind of fit your category, which we yeah. call the uh, work, you know the professional, uh, the busy professionals is sure. what we call them, sure. right? Uh, that they have some sort of a white collar job, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they're so busy that they'll give their job eight, 10, 12 hours a day to get a promotion to make an additional 20,000 for the year, but they won't put one property aside a year for themselves. Why do you think that is? Lack of knowledge okay. could be one. Not able to get out of their comfort zone could be another. Um, that's it. I think if you're ready to get out of the comfort zone, there is knowledge available. But you think, uh, because I think there's one more factor, especially for people who are smart, mm -hmm. right? That when you're smart and you go get a certain degree, and you become good at your particular profession that you chose, I think most people quit growing. Agreed. Right, meaning that they, and it, it, it's, we're all in danger of doing that because right. we become kind of, we are in our own cocoon, in our own bubble, right? And then, oh, I'm smart. Mm -hmm. I know everything, 
right? What is there for you to tell me? And just because you're smart, that doesn't mean there's not a lot to learn, right? In yes. fact, the smarter you are, the more you should be realizing that you don't even know a thimble about anything. None of us do, because the amount of knowledge, the amount of things that people do is so vast yeah. around us. that, And I, th I, I see this a lot of times, that we become legends in our own mind. True. Right? And I've always felt this. I mean, the Indian community, when you look at it today, as a group, right, we're the highest earners in this country. It's just yeah. a fact of life today. Yes. Right? We come from somewhere where there's lack of resources, lack of opportunities. It's changing, but still, compared to America, it's nowhere close, obviously. Mm -hmm. Right? And we come here, we do well, and we do better than we had ever thought we would, sure. right? I mean, clearly. And then it's like, oh, I'm somebody, right? Rather than keep growing, and you see that, that people who keep kind of upping their standards in terms of their mental growth, they end up with huge businesses. Agreed. Right? Yeah. And I, I see that a lot of times with working professionals, with people who are busy, they're so busy Right, that they, they they're too busy to build any net worth and to build any cash flow. Yes. Right. Um, I mean, this was an interesting, funny conversation I was having with Surya. He asked me, he's like, Andrew, Andrew what do you think the average Indian person uh, that has a good job, how much do you think they retire with? I'm like, dude, I don't know. I've never had a job, so I have no idea. Mm. Right. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe two, three million. I was like, I don't know. You know more people like that. He's like, yeah, but doesn't it seem like a joke? I'm like, dude, you don't even spend a penny. So forget about what, I mean, it is a joke because you're not going to, but I'm like, yeah, that seems like a pettance. Two, three, four million bucks today when you look at it in what is possible, yes. right? It is a pettance, right? Yes. I mean, to me, should at least have a million dollars in cash flow every single year, Yeah. right? I mean, like if you fast forward five, eight, 10 years from today, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that should be the minimum standard because that's possible. True. Right. So now going back, you come to us 2015. Mm -hmm. Right. What changed for you mentally? Since 2016 to 2015. Yeah. Since when I came, yeah. I mean, a lot of things. I think very important thing is the mindset. OK. Right. I mean, uh, like I, in 2011, I had a mindset of that. Hey, my properties should be at this number and whatnot. And uh, then when I, you know, uh, became a part of mastery, uh, the mindset changed in like, hey, you know what, based upon the market conditions, what's going on? You got to be aware of that. And then you determine what property works and what does not work. But that was one shift. Other than that, a lot of things changed, right? Um, I was doing uh, consulting full time, uh, running that business. I gave that up. Um, and now I'm full time into real estate since 2011, I'm sorry, 2021. And uh, currently I have uh, experimented and working in multiple uh, property, real estate related sure. businesses, right? So that has changed. Um, so at one point you tried construction. Yes. Right, which I was saying, hey man, this is a crazy business. Yeah. Right, why did you go into construction? <laughs> So I acquired a few properties in 2021. So I was like, man, I already have properties. I built a team to rehab my properties. My entrepreneur mind sets in and says, hey, you know what? Can I extend the service of Good my job. construction crew and make money, some money on the side? And that's how I started extending my services as a construction guy, as a GC. So it starts out by, you know, I need it for myself then I need to keep these guys busy and maybe I can make money uh, doing it. That's, yes. that's how it starts off. Yes. But I mean, and, and this is, I feel bad for people in construction. I mean, if you run a huge company, God bless you, but most <laughs> people don't, right? It is the most pain in the ass business yes. ever. And um, people are never happy. And it's not like your fault. It's not their fault. It's just, that's the type of the business yeah. that you're in. Yeah. Right? At least you're a hooker. They're happy afterwards, at least maybe for 10 <laughs> minutes, right? Unless they want a second go round. No, I mean, I'm just telling you, construction <laughs> business is the thankless job, True. right? It's a thankless job. It's like being a cop today, right? I mean, it's like, hey, listen, you meet people at their most worst time in their lives, and at the end of the day, it's your fault. And that happens in construction all the time. Every time. Right? Yes. Every time. So 
uh, you kind of transitioned out of that. Was it because of those factors? That was one major factor. And yes. It's hard to scale. It's, it's hard to scale. And uh, uh, see, my focus at that time was investors. Uh, fact be told, if I'm marketing my construction services to investors, I cannot command top dollars. Right. My personality is, when I take on something, I want to do the best. Right. I want to give 100% to it. And my 100% is not that cheap. <laughs> no, I mean, it doesn't go together. It does not it does, go together. It doesn't go together no. and becomes difficult. And the investor, rightfully so, they're trying to get the work done for the cheapest price possible. Correct. They have to, right? Yes. Because its prices have gone up so much. I mean, yes. all the factors, yeah. right? And you didn't want to go into retail business. No. Because that's another whole can of worms. Uh, I don't want to be in the fights of uh, couples. I want red color and I want blue. Right. I'm, I, I'm, I don't have bandwidth okay. or okay. temperament for that. Okay. So... Then you made a switch towards yeah. property management. Kind of. It was an overlap. Uh, okay. Yes. Got it. So um, how did that come about? It come out wonderful. Okay. No, no. How, how did that transition come oh, out? Oh, how? Okay. So one friend of mine, he was facing a problem with one of his tenants who was behind on rent for a few months. And we were having just a just a chat, you know, and he was like, man, looks like I want to sell off my assets. You know, he had few. Um, and um, we're talking about the problems he's facing. And I'm like, hey, I'll help you solve your problems. Don't sell the properties. Why sell them? It takes time and effort and money to acquire them. So I helped him with one property, uh, you know, had his tenant move out, uh, helped him recover some money from the time I started helping him. Fast forward, he said, hey, Rashad, can you help me manage all my properties that I have? I was not ready to do management at that time. It was in my, in my, in my thought process, but I was not ready to take on business at that time. But since I helped him, and he said, you know, and I was like, okay, you know, I'll help you, no problem. So as a courtesy, I helped, as a courtesy at that time. Uh, but I think that was a turning point for the property management business. Okay. So you figured not only did you need the service, but other people needed that service. That is correct. And that was something that you could scale. 100%. Right? Because property management business is a business that, uh, it's not the easy business, but it is no. a scalable business if uh, you do it correctly. 100%. Right? So uh, in that, whenever, what are the typical clients that's your ideal client? Right? Like the other day, there was somebody here, the office from Mastery, mm -hmm. and I mean, she had a mess on her hands. Yes. Right? Bunch of properties, they're all paid off, right? <laughs> I mean, 18, 19 properties, they're all paid off. A lot of them good areas, right? Really a good. A plus areas. areas. A, a plus areas. Yes. And she's not collecting rent. I mean, and it's just like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah. Right? And so I'm like, hey, you really, you need to call Rishabh. I mean, this is not, a, if you need it, I'm like, you really, really need the help. So, and this is not atypical. This is kind of, unfortunately, for a lot of people who are very smart, she's a smart lady, right? Yes. Uh, clearly, she saved every penny she could, and she's bought good quality properties, yes. but she could not manage them for the love of God because she's so busy, right, uh, being busy. I mean, yeah. and... and with Which her is, other business. Yeah, absolutely. Right, yeah. And it's it's not like, and I'm bringing this up because that happens to me. Right? I can buy properties that are going out of style, yeah. but I'm not the best manager, so I have people for that because I, if it was yes. left up to me, I would run them amok. Yeah. Right? What was going on with her? So uh, she had a property manager, of course, and uh, the property manager was not managing properties properly. Uh, most likely siphoning on off some money, uh, most likely giving fraudulent bills that didn't exist, um, and uh, it was a mess. She had no clue how much rent she collected from which tenant and when. She had no clue how much money was given to her for what property. So basically bookkeeping was a mess, 100% mess. Um, there were zero inputs taken from her how to manage her properties. Um, so that's the reason why, you know, uh, we started the talks. So it was a mess from the property manager perspective. Right. No, her properties were great. I mean, when I yes. looked at her portfolio, I'm like, oh my God. Yes. Right. You're millions. I mean, literally millions and millions of dollars in equity, yes. right? Three, $4 million in equity. 
and properties paid off in A yeah. areas. Yes. She bought them at great prices. Yes. And I'm like, hey, listen, a couple of them, maybe you tweak them a little bit, but I mean, put a little dead on it if you need to and just buy more, Yeah. right? I mean, clearly you do a good job buying properties. Yes. So it just needs to be managed correctly. Yeah. So for you, as somebody's listening to this and they say, hey, I want a good property manager. I mean, you're managing properties for people that are from California, that are from different markets. Correct. They don't even live in the Chicago market, right? Um, yes. What is your ideal profile client? Is it somebody that says, oh my God, I have one property and uh, Rishabh, can you manage my little one property? Uh, or what is the sweet spot for you? So when we started doing property management, uh, my minimum was five doors. So I need five doors minimum. Um, and that's the minimum right now too. But as we are growing, uh, we are venturing into where our minimum has to be about 10 to 15 properties or doors, I should say, not right. properties. So a typical client, an ideal client for us would be who can bring on board, let's say 15 doors at a minimum. And they need a company who can take care of their assets as if the assets were their, their own. Right. Like take due care of it. Um, that's the ideal client. Now, the ideal client of ours has a challenge with either time. They don't have enough time on hand or they have a challenge with temperament, meaning they love real estate, they wanna buy as much as they can, but they don't have the temperament to manage them. Okay. And they don't wanna build a team around And it. these are two different skill sets. They're two different skill two sets. Two completely different skill yes. sets, right? Yes, and that's where we come in the picture, helping those clients who not necessarily want to grow alone, I mean, uh, grow their portfolio, but they are facing a challenge with either time or temperament. And there is one more thing I'd like to add. What I have seen is, we know since we started doing property management, when it is an owner-managed property, an owner is already time-pressed with other things. They make decisions that are easy to make, takes less time of theirs. Doing that, what happens is they lose on the extra cash flow they can get. How? One property, uh, just one client of mine, uh, because they're so busy with the time, uh, with their with the job and whatever they do, they don't have time to, they didn't have the time to go and collect the rent in time. They were losing money because of that. Second thing what people will do is when they don't have time or temperament, if some maintenance request happens, they'll go to one or two people, whoever is the cheaper or reasonable, they'll just go with them without realizing what the actual cost of the rehab should be or the repair should be. So when we come on board as a property manager, or I should say any good property manager per se, uh, would make sure that client is not overpaying for the real work that is being done. And that itself is a lot of value. You know, this is, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's Airbnbs, if it's short terms, if it's uh, long term yeah. properties, like finding a good person Yes. that you can work with because that that is one of those things in the business with property management because yeah. every time you, clearly you have a call that comes in right yes. and the oh the air conditions aren't working yeah. well do you know it used to be kind of it was cold just 2 weeks ago now <laughs> maybe go from uh you know uh winter mode to off to ac now this yeah. may sound like very very basic but yeah. some people don't know that. They genuinely, and it's not that they're dumb, it's just like they've, they're not mechanically inclined. They don't know that you go back and forth. The last apartment they were in was a big building that they were in where the temperature was controlled for the whole building, right? And sometimes you will get calls that are very easy fixes. Yeah. But you have to talk them through that, that, hey, did you do this, 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 and this? Because a lot of times you can avoid that guy going out and charging 100, 150 bucks if you just solve the problem on the phone. Maybe it's a filter, maybe it's a, uh, you know, a, a circuit breaker tripped, right? I mean, small things can make add up to big things. Forget about uh, the markups on materials purchased, on uh, calls, on all the other stuff, right? right? And you can have a property that is paid off and makes zero cash flow. Yeah, 
right? I mean, uh, which we have seen in the past, yes. right? So with the property management business, I mean, I love that business because I've always believed that if in any way mm -hmm. you can structure your life where you keep building wealth, mm -hmm. which is the cash flow properties, and you have a business which is parallel or in the same vertical, mm -hmm. to me, this is in the same vertical as what you already do. True. You're kind of in the front seat where sure. you get access to more and more and more properties. You see people who are in distress. You, you're you in that business all the time, and so you have a better pulse on the market. Would you agree with that? 100%. Right? Yeah. So with the property management business, right, uh -huh. that's obviously you're managing properties for people. How many properties do you manage today? So right now we're 150 doors. About 150 doors. We, we have a, a, a visibility of 175 by end of the year. We have some more clients coming that in. They're onboarding on. They're onboarding on. Okay, got yeah. it. Okay, so basically between now and the end of the year, I hope you're at 250, right, rather yeah. than just 175, or yeah. right? But is that a business you want to scale, or you see that, well, if once I get to 400 doors, 500 doors, I want to say that's it as of today? No, I'm aggressively working to scale it. Okay. So we're building teams around it. So our target uh, uh, vision is that, hey, we should be at, 1,500, 2,000 doors in the next five years or less. Okay. So is that a business that you can set up? Where obviously it's a managed business, uh -huh. meaning you're managing it. It's not like you're not managing the overall, obviously, right? But is that a business that can be as a operator, owner-operator, that you don't necessarily have to do the day-to-day -day stuff, but that is something that you can set up a good team yeah. and put it in place where you genuinely become kind of the owner manager of the business? I'm actually working on it as we speak. Okay. So that that is a business that's possible to put SOPs in place. Yes. Okay. Hundred percent. Okay. Otherwise I would be out of this business. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Got it. So um and that type of business, whenever you look at it overall, are there any benchmarks in the marketplace in terms of profitability wise, what should a good business like that run at in terms of profitability? Still running on those numbers. Okay. Um, but my general guidelines are uh, for any business, for that matter, right. something that is a mature industry, you know, sure. not like a a, a startup uh, company. Uh, the gross profit should be between twenty to thirty percent. Twenty to thirty percent. That's the rule of thumb I follow always. Okay. Got it. So basically, because the thing to realize is to manage ten properties, twenty properties, it takes the same amount of people, yes. right? To manage 100 to 130, it's the same amount of people, yes. right? Once you get to 200, right, you can't have one person doing that. So now to do 200, you can almost get to 300, 350 until it starts taxing the system. As you scale, yeah. your resources don't have to scale as much, Correct. right? Because yes. there's a lot of functions that a person can do that can be done in huge quantity and you're actually using that resources to their uh, to their potential. Yes. Right. Uh, and a lot of times, this is one of those businesses that. So a lot of times, people think, "Oh my God, you're managing 150 uh, properties or 500 properties, and the amount of calls you should be getting." Right. Uh -huh. I mean, to me, if a tenant calls you, right? This is just to me. If a tenant calls you, there's something wrong. Sure. I mean, and, and this has been my philosophy ever because there is no conversation that me and the tenant are supposed to have. Now, I'm being, ob of course, facetious, meaning uh, air conditioning didn't come on, something didn't, but clearly, if a tenant is calling you, 99.9% .9 times, there's a problem. Sure. Right? Yes. Either. <laughs> right? They don't call for fun. Right. <laughs> so, so the number of tenant calls, like we see uh -huh. this, like for every... For 30, 40 properties, if you own 30 properties, 40 properties, right, in the world I exist in, yes. right, I should have maybe one to two tenants that are going to be behind. That's yes. just how it is. Yes. Right? I can be the best manager in the world, but that's going to happen. Yes. Right? And that type of a portfolio, besides somebody opening, paying bills, blah, 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 that's a mundane task, mm -hmm. right? Not including that. As far as headache calls, if I'm getting more than four or five headache calls a month, mm -hmm. right? There is something wrong with my portfolio. Sure. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes and no, depends. 
Uh, sometimes the tenants are problematic too. No, no, no. no. What, what I mean is that I'm assuming my properties are good quality, right? Yes. I'm assuming my tenant selection is a good, stabilized, long-term tenant, right? That the the notion that, oh my God, I have 10 properties and Andrew, you don't understand how long it takes. No, you bought properties in poor areas, right? <laughs> you have poor tenant quality Yes. And clearly, they're not set up properly and they're not managed properly. That does not mean Correct. there are no problems, right? That having 30, 40, 50 properties should not take up all of your day. I agree with that. For, when you're talking about maintenance requests. I'm talking yeah, about maintenance requests. It should not. Something breaking down. Something, it should not. Right? That it is actually not that difficult no. to manage 20, 30 properties. It's not. If you're an owner operator, it's not that difficult. You know, you can easily manage 15, 20 properties uh, yourself. But what I've observed is the moment you are at 15 properties and more and you're trying to scale up while you have another business or full time job, it becomes very tricky. Right. right. No, and again, it's a skill set. Yes. That is a skill set to manage. Um, like in the office, right, we have. Uh, Miss Sandra, she manages close to 200 properties at a time. Sure. Right? And now, I don't get the calls, neither I do deal with them, but I can assure you one thing for sure, right? Even with those scales, mm -hmm. right? Relatively, you would be shocked. You'd be shocked how few calls we get, right? Agreed. Uh, that if you're getting a lot of calls, if you're getting a lot of upheaval all the time, you're... Uh, area selection is poor, your property selection is poor, and clearly you're not doing good tenant screening. 100%. Right? Yes. That for every 10, are you going to have something happen? Absolutely. Right? You're going to yeah. have, I mean, it, you get a lot of rain, you know, two, three, four inches of rain in an hour. Well, guess what? Probably a basement will flood, right? Meaning you'll get a little bit of water. That is called normal. Right, but if your flow is blowing up all the time and you have a chaos going on with 20, 30 properties, clearly you are not. There's something wrong in that whole equation. Correct. Right. Yes, and what I've seen is uh, most of the time when that happens is because uh, when the property was made ready for the tenant, there were things left out. Correct. That should have been taken care of. And uh, this is correct me if I'm wrong. If you get too many calls in the first two weeks. <laughs> because that's when the tenant has moved in, right? Now, you're going to get some things like, well, the washer dryer hasn't been used. Like, those kind of things happen, right? Uh, but uh, things like lint trap, right? I mean, the, the things that happen all the time. Once you get your production line humming and you know what the normal things are, right? From that point on, if you're managing it properly, you should not be getting those. You should not be, yeah. Right? Yes. So... What do you guys do to ensure that? Because whenever, obviously, with your properties, you have it dialed in, uh -huh. right? What do you do whenever a new person onboards? A new tenant, you mean? Yeah, a new tenant or a new landlord onboards because you have no clue of what the quality of their repairs were, what they sure. call a nice property versus sure. what you call a nice property, sure. right? Great question. So we actually are dealing with, we deal with this problem day in and day out. So what we're working now is we're making a checklist. We call it as a tenant ready or make ready checklist. So before a tenant moves in, we have to make sure those, those checklists are taken care of. That there are probably 10, 15 items that need to be reviewed. For example, washer dryer is working. For example, all the doors lock properly. For example, no torn screens. For example, there's no leaking faucet, right? Make sure the filter is changed. Uh, make sure all the bulbs have been replaced that don't work. Uh, so we are working now on that checklist. So that way, whenever we have a tenant turnover, our guys goes in, our team goes in, and they make sure the property is tenant ready for the next tenant. Okay. And I think a lot of these things are actually basic when you really think about it. Yeah. But if they're not addressed, yeah. now on one property, you'll have six trips. Yes. Right? If it's not addressed at one time, yes. right? If the smoke alarms are working. I mean, just the basic stuff. But yet, if it's addressed and it's properly addressed, within two, three hours, yeah. most of these things can be addressed. Yeah. And it's done with, and you don't have to ever worry about it. Exactly. I think it boils down to systemizing the process, right? If you have a system in place where what can you do proactively 
to have lesser headache when the tenant moves in, that system works. Got it. So somebody says today, right, mm -hmm. um, that, hey, uh, Rishabh, I want to buy multifamily properties. I'm just getting into real estate. Sure. Right? You just closed on uh, three six-unit buildings. Yes. Right? Uh, and I get this all the time. Like, Andrew, what, I'm, I just want to do multifamily. I don't want to do any of the small stuff. Right? What do you say to them? I think look at the end goal. Right? What are you trying to achieve? Because whether it's single family, a duplex, or a multifamily, or you have 60-unit building, it doesn't matter. Every asset class has a different pros and cons, and it requires a different skill set. It requires a different team. So what you have to look at is, number one, what is your end goal? That's very important, right? Then you have to look at what is your current skill set, right? And then you also have to look at what is your current team's capability. If any of those three things don't match up, you know what? It doesn't make any difference what you buy because you'll end up in negative. So, so don't worry about multi-unit or single family. Worry about those three things and then align where you are today based upon today on those three factors. What can you do? Probably the single family home. Go buy single family homes. And then eventually, whatever you want to do, you do. You know, it's, it's like I always look at it this way, right? We've all seen somebody that's a great athlete. We've all seen maybe you're into Formula One or, you know, whatever, car racing, whatever it is. Right. And you're like, well, you know, man, I, I don't want to learn how to get my driver's license. I'm just going to go drive Formula One car. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I don't I mean, either you're stupid or you're an idiot. Pick one. Right. It's just it's just so silly to me. And I mean, I know this statement is made a lot of times with people. Uh, well, you know, Andrew, it's just as 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 simple as buying a hundred hundred unit building as it is to buy a single family property. I'm sorry. You're bullshitting. Right. I mean, come on. Who are we kidding? Right. Somebody who doesn't have a clue, right, that you don't have a penny to your name or you have a little bit of money, you've never bought anything. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying if the goal is to get to 10000 a month, I promise you, start small and then start scaling. You want to get to 20000 a month, start small, start scaling. There'll come a point where there will be properties that'll come up that are multi-units, that are bigger properties, that are new opportunities, and you'll be able to suddenly make certain leaps. But you go buy a multi-unit building or you think you're going to put it together, right? Uh, guess what's going to happen? The chances of you failing or the chance of you having no cash flow. There's a lot of multi-unit operators that are, that, oh, we own 200 million, 400 million, 800 million in, ca in cash flow, quote, unquote, properties. Yeah. And that have zero cash flow. Zero. True. True. Right? And I've always believed that start small, start building it, get to 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 a month in cash flow. And then you can make any leap that you want based on your skill set, the amount of money you have, the amount of money you can borrow, the sophistication that you've gained. Yeah. Would that be a correct statement? 100%. Like the multi units I bought, I mean, if I was in 2011, would I ever be able to buy those multi units? Never. And would it be a wise idea? No. No. Not at all. Because you could not manage those suckers. I could not manage those suckers. They're distressed. They are a value. I mean, not distressed, but they're value add. Uh, and there's a lot of rehab involved. Uh, me in 2011 would not be able to do that. Right. So it does require building those skill sets and, of course, cash reserves and other things. Yeah. And sometimes people have this wrong idea that bigger is better. No. Right. And I am... 100% no. against that. Yeah, right? bigger is not better. The bigger is not better, <laughs> right? I know you hear this all the time. Oh, well, isn't it, you know, you just do one big roof rather than 10 roofs, right? I mean, my friend, you just never have run a business, <laughs> right? Uh, right? When you run a business, then let me know, right? Yeah. Because it sounds great. It's not necessarily bigger is better, right? A lot of times, smaller is much, much, much more profitable, yeah. and you don't have to answer to anybody. 100%. Right? Oh, yeah. So uh, yeah. for today, sitting in 2024, mm. right, still the market is hot, mm. right, in general, right? Mm. Um, there's a lot of pressure, obviously, on the buy side, yeah. meaning there's just a lot of competition. Where are you finding properties? I'm leveraging MLS. MLS, still. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There are deals out there. You just have to negotiate the price right. 
right? right. What works? You went and you went out and got your license. Yes. Right. I mean, you now you have to obviously because you're doing property management. Correct. Right. Yes. But before that, you went and got your license. And did you get it just for your investment purposes? Why did you get it? Just for my purposes. Okay. I'm not interested in retail clients. Okay. But then obviously the property management came as a course of it. Correct. Um, so, but you got it just, do you have to have it? No. No. You do not. To to acquire property, you don't need a uh, uh, license. Uh, okay. You don't need to be a licensed professional. Though. Okay. So you're obviously, are you still doing any flips or no? <laughs> to date, I have done only two flips. Two flips. One was accidental flip, which was a rental, but then there was uh, too much cost of repair. I converted to flip. And the second was uh, a partnership uh, with a friend who didn't know how to do flips. And he was like, hey, Rishabh, can you just help me? He had the property already. So we did a partnership. I'm, I, I don't do flips. Okay. That's not something that you do. I'd rather sit back, relax, have fun, and uh, do my rentals. Okay, got it. So with rentals realistically, so we're 2024, where, what's your goal for you by say end of 2025? 20, I wanna double this, you uh, wanna double the, the, the one I have right now, okay. yes. Okay, so you wanna basically put kind of pedal to the metal? That is correct, okay. yes. Got it, okay. Uh, and is it because you have the team now in place and this is something that you're really, really paying attention to? I, I think both. Uh, but most importantly is the the uh, the focus. Okay. Earlier, my focus was you know all over the place. Uh, you know, I'll do real estate a couple of years, then I stop and whatnot. Uh, now it's a heavy focus is real estate only acquisition and property management, and that's it. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, yesterday, I was listening to something. It was that you know less than point zero one percent of population in the United States owns 90% of all hotels and motels. Wow. <laughs> and we all know what the last name is. <laughs> yeah. Patels. Yeah. Right? And it's a fascinating story. But I genuinely, and I, uh, I mean, I feel very, very strongly about it. I genuinely, genuinely feel, I mean, if you're a busy professional, if you're in the real estate industry, right, and you don't own 10 or 20 houses that are paid off, paid off, not just properties that are just with debt, right? Yeah. Shame on you and shame on me. Shame on me for not brainwashing you to own properties. And I'm not, it doesn't help me, it'll help you. And shame on you because you're doing a disservice to your kids. Probably one of the easiest things you can ever do is one a year, one every other year, put it aside. And I know the typical hang up is, Andrew, you don't understand, I don't have time. You don't understand, I don't have the money. You don't understand, I don't know where to start, right? Yeah. And I think we have all made those excuses. And I certainly can tell you 100%, I have no explanation today why I don't have 500 properties. And not because of the money. Not because yeah. of the money, right? If you don't believe in you know, owning a lot of properties, I mean, buy them, pay them off. Give it to charity. Do it for <laughs> humanity, right? But I'm telling you, it's the simplest way. Yeah. It is the simplest bloody way of building wealth. And there's not a whole hell of a lot that goes wrong. No, it doesn't. Right. Unlike what stories say, hey, right. I don't want to take a call of toilet breaking right. down in the middle right. of the night. I mean, I'm doing real estate since 2011. You're doing right. even before that. How many times we got a call where toilet broke down in the middle of the night? You know, zero. Had, so I've had one. I have zero I, so far. I've had one <laughs> since 2008. Oh, right, yeah. and we've probably touched a few thousand transactions. Yeah, and this was on a Airbnb. Huh. And you know, guess what we did? I didn't even know it broke down. Right, office called something called a plumber, and the plumber <laughs> fixed it. Right. I mean, we have these hangups, and I'm not sure why it is, <laughs> but this is really, really, really silly. So to wrap it up, uh, Rishab. What would you say to the person that today says, okay, I'm ready, I wanna get started, where do I go? What do I do? What should I be doing in 2024? Um, join a local RIA, right, uh, some meetup, right? And if you're in Chicago, then of course Chicago RIA is the place where I got started. Right? Or join us online. Or join us online, yeah, right? exactly. Join yeah. us online each week, uh, yeah. but 
how important is it to get out and start looking at what the hell is going on? <laughs> you can bring horse to the well. You cannot make it drink water, right? right? I mean, uh, action is needed. Right. Without action, nothing's going to happen. So you definitely have to put the action to go out to the events, even if they're on Zoom, online, or they're in person. For me, in person is better always because then you have an element of networking with other like-minded people. But if that's not a possibility, Zoom, whatever works, right, online. But it's very important. It's imperative, without which it's not going to happen. You have to be out, uh, go to different meetings, Chicago RIA meetings, network with people, like-minded people who have similar or same goals, and then go from there. Guys, this has been absolutely fun because I've uh, been a small part of what Rishabh has done. And literally, for people like him, it's always fun because not only can we sit back, reminisce about it, but what happens is he can look at me and go, uh, Andrew, man, you should be here, right? And I can look at him and go, hey, man, what the hell is wrong with you? You should be here, right? And it's kind of fun when you make friends with people that we're not looking at, uh, oh, my God, where he went, but it's like how far we can all go. That's really what the race is, not me against him or him against I, the race is what is our own God-given abilities that God gave you. And that is the race is you with you. Having said that, uh, please like, share, share with your friends. And if you have a great guest that we can have on the podcast, please let us know. We love to want we want to have people that are inspirational, that are brilliant minds, that can share their ideas and thoughts to keep continuing to inspire you and us so we can all grow together. Having said that, this is Andrew with Cashflow for Life.